Side note, I'm doing a conference next week in Germany. Um, the conference is being organized by the Deutsche Bundesbank. That is the Federal Central Bank of Germany. They're doing one on peer-to-peer -peer financial services. Deutsche Bank is involved, a bunch of academics are involved. Fantastic, great. Um, they need to pay me for my plane tickets. So we tried to organize a wire transfer because they don't have any Bitcoin, which is my preferred method of payment. So we tried to arrange for a wire transfer. I sent them all the swift wiring details and all of that. And then I waited and I waited and I waited. And four or five days go by and I call them and say, well, we're closed today. So two more days go by and then uh, they say, well, yeah, the swift code you gave us was for US dollar deposits. We need the swift code for euro deposits. Contact your bank to find out so that I waited until my bank opened, contacted them, got the number for euro deposits. Um, <laughs> they sent the money. It, uh, it, it, it only took a few hours once they managed to send the money. Uh, in the conversion, of course, in the meantime, uh, the euro had dumped because you know it's a really volatile currency. <laughs> um, and so I was exposed to all of that volatility. Plus, I ended up paying some of the fees. Anyway, so it ended up in my bank account, and you know, there's a bit of money there. It's a it's an expensive plane ticket from here to Frankfurt, so um, it, it was quite a bit of money. They wired it through, and of course, my bank sees a wire coming from Deutsche Bundesbank, and you know, those people are shady, right? So, uh, so you can't actually release those funds immediately because who are they? Who do, we don't know them. They're just the Federal Bank of Germany. It could be anyone. So they gotta hold my funds. So they hold my funds for five business days because Bundesbank is shady. And then five business days later, my funds release, except for eighty dollars. And I, I don't know why, but for some reason they released like a few thousand dollars. And the eighty dollars I kept to hold on for another two business days. Like that's gonna be the difference. And then finally, all the money released, and then I transferred it. And that took two more days to transfer it from the account that I had that had Swift access to my checking account so I could actually pay for the plane ticket. Total elapsed time, 16 days. And I called I emailed them back the, and I said, you know what? Forget doing a presentation about anything else. Why don't I just come and talk about my experience getting paid from you <laughs> and then end my presentation with and that's why Bitcoin. And then drop the mic. I don't want to stop. <laughs> because if if the Federal Bank of Germany can't pay a contractor in less than 14 days, and they think this is normal, that's why Bitcoin. Right? That there is messed up. And so. Just give people the opportunity to try Bitcoin, and very soon something like that will happen to them. The more they deal internationally, the more they like. If someone has an import-export business, they have contractors abroad. They get paid by someone in another country. They have to convert currencies. Any of that, and suddenly all of these, you know, CNBC stories about Bitcoin died and volatility, and and they then look at their bank and they say, you know what, I'm opting out. All right. Let's take a few more questions, then we'll wrap up. And we're uh, really excited to have Andreas Antonopoulos here with us today. Uh, he is actually the founder of the San Francisco Bitcoin Devs back in November 2013. And uh, we have grown today to a community of 600 developers who are making decentralized applications and coding on the blockchain. We're fortunate enough to be here today with some help of sponsors. We have a budget from BitPay, Chain, and uh, ChangeTip. O'Reilly has also provided some budget along with some books that we'll be raffling off. We also have, I'm very excited for this, some tickets to his upcoming conference on Wednesday. Uh, O'Reilly is hosting a Bitcoin conference. So we'll be raffling some of those off, and I hope you see Andreas speak there. Andreas has been heads down working really hard on his new book, Mastering Bitcoin. And he also recently came from the Canadian Senate where he was uh, lobbying for the use of Bitcoin. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited to introduce Andreas Antonopoulos. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's it's really great to be back in San Francisco. 
as Michael said, I um, was involved early on in starting up the San Francisco uh, Bitcoin Developers Meetup. And uh, that was uh, a meetup group that had uh, two members in November of 2013. Yeah, two members. And uh, it was easy because we just sit across from each other and talk. Uh, then it got a bit bigger, and then it started growing really, really fast. Now, um, I'd like to say that I started the San Francisco Bitcoin Developers Meetup Group in order to empower Bitcoin in the Bay Area. Actually, I did it because um, I'm lazy, and writing a technical book on Bitcoin is really hard. Um, and getting together with a bunch of developers who will ask questions is the easy way to write a technical book on Bitcoin, because you quickly find out um, what topics are of interest, what things bring up a lot of questions. And then I actually got to try out a lot of the early material for the book by presenting it to that group and then getting questions, um, including questions I couldn't answer because I had things wrong. So there was always a disclaimer before each presentation, what you're about to see will contain errors. Your job is to write the code that finds those errors. So um, that was the process for that. And today, um, one year and three months later, we're at 600 members and growing very, very rapidly. So 600 members, uh, all developers in a group about Bitcoin. And then on the other side, we've got the San Francisco Bitcoin Meetup Group, which has, I don't know, what, 1,200 members now? 1,800. Wow, 1,800 members. Um, another huge and smashing success. Which, you know, all of that said, it, it's a real pity, uh, because as you heard uh, two weeks ago, uh, Bitcoin died. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just kind of doing the last tour here, and we can then pack everything up and I'll go home because Bitcoin died. Um, that was the third time this year it died. Uh, it's died about 17 times since I got into Bitcoin. Uh, in fact, there's a really nice site called BitcoinObituaries.com where you can go and read the media proclaiming Bitcoin dead some 20 or 30 times since 2010. Yeah, turns out it's not so dead. Who to think? You know, I mean, this happens again and again and again. The media proclaims Bitcoin's death. Bitcoin continues to work. And the reason this is a hard time understanding the difference between a currency a technology and a currency in support of a technology or a technology based currency that works together. It's really hard to understand this concept because this concept has never existed before. So they look at Bitcoin and we say it's a currency. No, it's a technology. No, it's a technical currency. No, it's a currency technology. And the media get really, really confused. So what they do is they treat it like a stock. They treat it as if it's the index stock. Right? Now imagine if 1995 the internet had a stock you know, on NASDAQ called INTRNT or something like that. Um, and that way, every couple of months, Bloomberg could put up a show and they could talk about how the internet died because um, you know, Prodigy had a technical malfunction and a lot of users got disconnected. Oh, the internet just died. And then a few months later, uh, an internet company goes out of business, and they can publish a story saying oh, the CEO of the internet <laughs> was jailed, or <laughs> the internet went bankrupt. I mean, that's what they do for Bitcoin, right? Because they can't tell the difference between currency, technology, stock, and individual companies in the space. It's all really, really confusing. So the internet died last week, right? Bitcoin died last week. Now. I was there for a lot of those stories, and I actually saw the same kind of media coverage back in the early 90s. People talked about the internet, and today we look back and it's like, well, obviously it was going to be the, you know, the most amazing technology, and it changed everybody's life. But back then, not many people thought that, right? I had conversations where we would have very senior executives. Uh, in 
large organizations and we present them about the internet, right? In 91, maybe 1990, we do presentations. I was a student and consultant at the time. We do presentations. My, one of my friends reminded me of this scene um, from the early 90s where one of the executives said, this is great, how can we buy it? Like, and they wanted to buy the company, like the internet, the company. They wanted to buy it out and, <laughs> and then, I don't know, charge by the minute or something. And, and so this is exactly the kind of attitude we saw. So there were some people who were like, let's buy it. There were some people who were like, yeah, th this sounds really dangerous, so we're going to stop it. Right? We're going to turn it off. And some government people said, well, we didn't, like, we, we, we didn't give you permission to do this. How can you be doing this? We didn't give you permission to do this. And uh, any of this sound familiar? Because we're seeing all of this being repeated with Bitcoin. And, and that's what's really just amusing to me, to see this history being repeated again and again. The inability to understand how a technology that operates across borders, that operates in a completely decentralized fashion, can deliver trust. And then thinking that you can stop that, or you can turn it off, or that because one company had a financial problem, then the entire technology is dead. Last week, there was a big conference in Miami, and at that conference, Jeff Garzik announced the culmination of one of the projects he's been working on, which is Bitcoin in space. Which is an amazing project. And what they're doing there is they're using a microsat technology. These are satellites that are about a cubic foot, and they're putting a Bitcoin node on it. And that's just the first step because they also want to put Bitcoin mining in space too. But for the first step, we're talking about putting a Bitcoin node that can accept and relay transactions from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world and be part of the Bitcoin network. And I I just find that just amazing because it adds another layer of resiliency. Plus it's really cool and sci-fi like. But it, it adds another layer of resiliency to the network because you know it's kind of hard to serve a warrant on a satellite. <laughs> And uh, I'm pretty sure they're not going to be uh, wasting any anti-satellite missiles to take down a little Bitcoin node. But anyway, so uh, Bitcoin itself is a decentralized technology that is extremely resilient. It's resilient from a technology perspective because it is uh, extremely decentralized. There is no uh, central point that can collapse, that can be switched off, that can be taken out of commission, that can be sued, that can be bought, uh, that can be corrupted. The network works as a system that is participatory. Uh, and the mechanism behind Bitcoin is something we call participatory consensus. Right? It's a consensus by all of the participants in the network. And this model of organization is a brand new thing. It hasn't existed in human civilization before. We've had participatory networks. The internet is a participatory network. In, on the internet, for example, we do participatory media, right, where you can be simultaneously a producer and a consumer of media. You can be a blogger. You can be part of the conversation. Um, we do that with video, uh, citizen journalism, right, where you can be uh, a journalist simply by virtue of having been there at the time when something important happened. And this was a brand new model which really started in the 90s and started becoming commercial. Now, if you asked me back in the 90s, do you think you're ever going to see um, CNN have a website? I'd be doubtful. Uh, if you ask me, do you think CNN will be showing tweets on TV? I'd be doubtful. Uh, but if you ask me, do you ever think CNN will be showing tweets on TV instead of reporting, because the tweets are the reporting? <laughs> I would have laughed. <laughs> Who's laughing now, right? You watch uh, global events today, um, like the like the revolution in Egypt, and and you've got people like Anderson Cooper or one of these you know um, talking heads on CNN. 
And they're like, as you can see from the scro scrolling Twitter feed in the background, here's what just happened in Cairo. Well, I could see that on my phone. So I don't really need you to read it to me. Um, and then they go through the whole dance. They're like, what do you think it means, Jenny? I don't know. What do you think it means, Anderson? Well, things are really tense in Cairo right now, aren't they? Yeah, well, that's what they said on the tweet just there. <laughs> now, it's amusing to us to watch now, but think a moment for what this represents. And what this represents at a very basic level, is a complete subversion of the role of authority in news. Because authority in news used to be derived from the size of your printing press, from the size of your broadcast network. You had the truth because you were able to print 350,000 copies of the truth and deliver them to New Yorkers the next morning. You had the truth because you had access to people in Washington. You had the truth because you could broadcast it to two million people on TV. The truth and authority became confused as one. People started thinking that just because you have the network, that means you're telling the truth. Just because you have the printing press, that means you're telling the truth. And of course, now we live in a world where that's no longer true. The very essence of authority was flipped on its head. And there was no more moment in my life that was as clear of that distinction than the time when we were hearing all over the internet and reading that evidence of WMD was bullshit. Right? Evidence of WMD in Iraq was bullshit. It was fabricated. We were reading about Ahmad Chalabi on the internet. And meanwhile, the New York Times was publishing lies. Judith Miller was publishing lies. Lies that led to war. Lies that ended up killing 3,000 Americans, a million and a half Iraqis, destroying several countries. And now, are leading to a series of civil wars and conflicts throughout the Middle East. Authority died during that year. Because for the first time ever, the truth was coming from the front lines. and We were hearing it for the first time on the internet, even while we were being lied to on every other medium. Well, Bitcoin is an extension of that idea. Bitcoin is the subversion of the authority of currency. Bitcoin is the idea that currency doesn't derive its value because it has the face of a queen on it. It doesn't derive its value because it's printed by an organization run by the banks, the Federal Reserve. It doesn't derive its value because a government says it has value. Because throughout history, governments haven't been very good at saying things have value. Or they can say it, but that doesn't mean they actually have value. Most recently, we saw the European Union have a little spat with Switzerland over exactly what the value of the Swiss franc versus the euro was. A lot of things were said, but the market said otherwise. Up until 2008, currency was created from sovereignty. Sovereign nations, kings, emperors, despots, tyrants, leaders, call them whatever you want, created currency and told us this is the currency you will use and you will use no other currency. And at some point we confused sovereignty for value. We confused the authority for the truth. We started thinking that simply because a nation built it, it must have value. And then we went one step further. We thought the only place value can come from is if a government creates it. If a king says it has value, that it has value. And Satoshi Nakamoto gave us a completely different perspective. In 2008, we were now able to create currency that is unforgeable, that is automatic, that is based on mathematics, that is global, that is instantaneous, that is secure that is fungible, 
that is immediately recognizable, that is verifiable electronically by any user. And that is a really powerful form of currency, and people started using it. And now we're discovering the truth about currency. And that is that value comes from how many people use it, not from the photo of Lizzie on the piece of paper. Elizabeth, the Queen of England, if you don't know who I'm talking about, has her photo on half a dozen currencies around the world. And that's not where the value comes from. After 2008, currency creates sovereignty. Currency creates power. People making choices about currency can build a better future. We can make choices about currency that give us not just purchasing power, but political power, control, and the ability to trade with other people around the world. Now, a lot of people who are involved in Bitcoin in the United States understand this. A lot of people come from the libertarian movement. But in the end, Bitcoin isn't going to be libertarian. It's not going to be libertarian any more than it's going to be communist or anarchist or Presbyterian. Bitcoin will just be currency, but it will be free, global, instantaneous, independent currency. And that seems simple until you realize how powerful it is in a world where two and a half billion people live in cash-based societies without access to banks, in a world where four and a half billion people have access only to their local currency, can't change it for anything and are strictly controlled over where and how they can use it. Bitcoin is going to change all of those things. and That's why I'm excited to be in this space. So, uh, with that little introduction, uh, I would like to do a series of questions and answers. And for tonight's format, um, I wanted to do a quick-fire Q&A. So, unlike some of the previous ones I've done, Instead of spending a lot of time answering each question, I'm, I'm hoping they're going to have enough questions that we can do really quick and rapid questions and answers. Um, let me start with a question for the audience. Um, has everyone received their raffle ticket? Who has a raffle ticket? Has no one received it yet? So we have signed up for the raffle. We actually have a bucket in the back where you can leave your business card or you can write your information, and we'll be raffling off books and uh, tickets. All right. So before we do that, I just want everybody to know about that. You write your name on a piece of paper, you put it in the bucket, and then uh, you have a chance to win a book. Let's not all get up and run to the bucket right now. That will disrupt things. I'll grab the bucket and I'll let it go around. All right, fantastic. And can you all wait for the mic whenever you ask a question so we can get it on the live stream as well? Yeah. Uh, I would also like to say that I, I will be delighted to sign books if you have them with you. We're also going to be giving out books. Um, if you're not a developer, honestly, don't buy my book, please. Um, it's available open source. You can read it online. There's no reason to be spending money. If you're not a developer, you're not going to find it that useful. It's interesting, sure, maybe, um, but it's really a book for developers. Uh, so, and if you are a developer, you can also get it on GitHub. So. It's up to you. I really appreciate it either way. Um, I'll be signing books. Uh, I'll be happy to answer additional questions and uh, do all of that after the Q and A session. I'm not going to leave for quite a while afterwards, so please stick around. Let's do questions. Great. Thank you. Did you uh, want to ask a question first? No, no. Never. Just let's take questions from the audience. All right. Hi, thank you. My name is Mark. So, uh, we were talking previously, I wanted you to talk about crowdfunding and Bitcoin, and what the you know, implications are for equity crowdfunding in Bitcoin. Thanks. Yeah, so, um, I think uh, crowdfunding is one of the great uh, applications for Bitcoin. Uh, generally speaking, you can take any one of the existing financial services, whether that's funding, equity, corporate governance, uh, payments, retail, etc., and you can just stick peer-to-peer -peer in front, and we are going to do that in Bitcoin using peer-to-peer -peer technologies. Crowdfunding is really interesting because even the most powerful platforms we have today, Kickstarter, things like that, are specific to some jurisdictions. They're centralized through companies that, that are very restrictive on what things they'll allow, 
and you have to have a credit card and a bank account and access to modern technology to use them. Um, I think crowdfunding on a global scale with alternative currencies like Bitcoin and through decentralized platforms is going to have an enormous impact on things that happen in the future. Because it opens up the receiving end of crowdfunding for so many more people. One of the things I'd like to highlight, Project Lighthouse was released last week. It is basically a platform that allows you to do Kickstarter type uh, all or nothing funding, where if you don't reach your goal, nobody spends any money, but if you do reach your goal, the company gets funded or the project gets funded. And the amazing thing about Project Lighthouse is there is no central server. Um, it's software, you can download it, you can start a Lighthouse project, you can ask for funding. People can download the Lighthouse app, they can put Bitcoin into their app, and the application will guarantee that the project only gets funded if it meets its goals. Um, so, really exciting things happening in that space. And we're going to start seeing those being applied to funding uh, Bitcoin developments as well, one of the really exciting applications. Hi, Blade in Self Promotion. I work for Swarm, who is doing equity crowdfunding. So come talk to me about this. Um, my question for you is sort of the way back when machine. How did you get involved in Bitcoin? Um, my background is in distributed systems and security. First time I read the, I read about Bitcoin. I thought it was nerd money. I laughed at it and I walked away. Second time, about six months later, I read the Satoshi Nakamoto paper. It blew my mind. I got hooked. I spent months reading everything I could about Bitcoin, and almost immediately after that, switched my focus full time to this. So, a question in the back. You're gonna have to move faster. I'm gonna do rapid fire. <laughs> Andreas, um, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, you were here. Um, talking at the Dogecoin. Yes. And you had envisioned a world where there would be thousands of alternative digital currencies. Yes. Uh, since then, we've seen a lot of altcoins take it up. Um, are you still of the mindset that we will see thousands of digital currencies with people using them, transacting them uh, on a daily basis? Yeah, absolutely. I think what we've seen is that um, thousands have come and thousands have gone. <laughs> Um, that's the nature of it. And keep in mind, when I say we're going to have thousands of currencies, that doesn't mean we're going to have thousands of currencies which will have monetary value. Many of them won't. Uh, in fact, most of them won't. Um, in my vision of currencies, I think we'll see uh, a Pareto distribution of power law, where basically you have a handful of currencies with a majority. If you graph them as a percentage, you have a handful with a majority of use, and then it tails off, and then you have a really, really long tail um, of thousands of currencies that have few users, niche applications, perhaps not much monetary value or none at all. Um, but the ability to create currency in the hands of everybody creates an environment where people will do that. So there, there are now zero costs and zero barriers to creating fully unforgeable global um, currencies that work from a technical perspective. <coughs> Very easily. So people will do that. Now, will they have value? Absolutely not. Will a lot of people use them? Absolutely not. Will most of them be gimmicks? Absolutely. Um, but that's fine, uh, because that means that we're now recognizing that currency is a form of human expression. It will happen in abundance. And out of that kind of roiling mass of experimentation and fads and um, fad based currencies and ridiculous currencies and Things like that. There will emerge currencies that will have broad use, um, and people who are laughing about that concept today, you know, will be surprised by what comes out of this culture. You know, I, I've said often, Justin Bieber coin at this point would be worth more than about uh, 30 national currencies if it launched tomorrow, uh, and it would have broader adoption. So at that point, the laughter would stop. We'd all be horrified. Uh, <laughs> And, and then we start saying things that make us sound like our parents, like, oh, young people these days, they trade Justin Bieber coin. Um, but the, the point is that I don't assign value, you don't assign value, kings and queens don't assign value, users do. And if they find that currency useful, you will have a little village in Papua New Guinea electronically trading on the Nokia phones Justin Bieber coin, 
And they will have no idea who Justin Bieber is. They'll know it's used to buy things and you can buy things with it. Well, guess what? There are villages in Africa right now who know nothing about who Queen Elizabeth is, but they know that the money that has her face on it works. Uh, there's really no difference between Justin Bieber and the Queen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Queen probably sings better, uh, but Justin Bieber has more fans. All right. Top business trends and new startups in the space. Um, I think the ones that are most interesting to me are the ones that uh, allow uh, the adoption of Bitcoin in places where we can't do things yet with banking. So, my vision is about the other six billion, the people who don't have access to banking today or have very limited access to banking, but have cell phones. Um, you know, there are some amazing statistics around cell phones, but. It's, Here's, here's a simple one. There are more people with text messaging cell phones than access to safe drinking water. And in terms of total manufacturing, I think more cell phones have now been made than humans currently alive. Uh, there are places where the nearest bank branch of your bank is a hundred miles upstream by canoe, and yet there's a cell phone, solar powered cell phone tower, microwave uplinked right there, and people in that village have text messaging phones. Usually a Nokia 1000, like the most popular phone in the world. Make Bitcoin usable on those devices, and we can see some immediate applications. Foreign remittances from immigrant workers um, back to their families, uh, international trade, international funding. Um, all kinds of things like that. There was uh, recently a commentator who said they were amazed. They, they were visiting, um, I think it was the Philippines, and they said, no matter where I go, you know, even the most rural places, one thing that's amazed me is that everybody knows the spot price of gold. Like, <laughs> they have nothing. They have no roads. They have no TVs. They have nothing. But using their cell phones, they can get, and they know the spot price of gold on the international markets. My vision is when they can trade using those same phones, then we have changed the world. So I'm very excited about those applications. I don't know what um, what we'll see coming out of that. What do you see as the number one thing needed for Bitcoin to reach mainstream adoption, and uh, when do you think that will happen? Uh, the one and only thing needed for Bitcoin to reach mainstream adoption is time. Uh, because with time, we're going to build better interfaces. We're going to evolve the technology. We're going to help people understand it. We're going to make it easier to use, easier to secure. Uh, we're going to spread it to more devices, to more systems. We're going to build more useful applications, um, and then it will be adopted. It's already being adopted, but I expect we're going to see that accelerate. Right now, Bitcoin is kludgy to use. It's difficult, very difficult to secure from an end-user perspective. Um, people somewhere say, someone sometimes say that we're the early adopters, and I like, um, I, I can't remember who said this, said, no, we're not the early adopters, we're the lunatic fringe. The early adopters come later. Uh, welcome to the lunatic fringe. Uh, it's, it's really the case that we're still very early in this technology, and um, I, I don't see any reason to do special things about Bitcoin. Um, I certainly don't think you need to market Bitcoin or push Bitcoin, or I, I certainly don't encourage people to invest in Bitcoin or do things like that. Um, talk about how Bitcoin is useful to you, and then demonstrate it. Right. So give people a bit of Bitcoin to play with. Let them experience it, and then it will happen. If you experience Bitcoin by using it a few times, not only does it give you an immediate kind of visceral understanding of what's special about it, but you can't then help but juxtapose that and compare it to your everyday banking experience. So as you're using Bitcoin, your bank decides to hold a check for five business days, which is seven actual days because they don't actually work on most days, right? Um, you've tried to do something and your bank closes at 4 p.m. on a Friday. Um, it takes weeks to do a, a wire transfer when it should take uh, minutes. Um, your own money is held captive and you have to pay fees for it. So on the one hand you're having that experience and on the other hand 
You're sending money across the world in tiny amounts for no fees instantaneously, and suddenly that picture starts getting really obvious. Um, Great story on this. Do you have any comments on IBM's um, Adapt that they just announced? Well, um, you know, I mean, that's that's the other thing that's really interesting, which is, um, on the one hand, you have very very serious people telling us that Bitcoin is a waste of time and won't ever amount to anything, and then on the other hand, you have people who actually study technology, like you know, maybe Mark Andreessen, who invented Netscape. And, Who's invested in a lot of companies in this space, or IBM, or you know many of the other companies, or Microsoft recently that are playing in this space? And you say, well, why are these people looking at this technology and saying we can do things with it? If you haven't heard, IBM's really strong drive um, in the last several years. They have kind of like these big five-year technology drives that you know they're they're doing. Um, uh, at the moment, one of their big pushes is the Internet of Things, which is the idea of uh, connecting uh, devices and sensors and things with uh, internet addresses, and then uh, being able to do really interesting things with them. And so, as part of that, someone went out and studied the blockchain technology and said, "Huh, you know, universal decentralized." Uh, uh, Registration and trust database that can be shared with any device, and the device can verify it on itself. Plus, Internet of Things. Ooh, this could be fun. So, Adept is the first paper they wrote about that. <laughs> um, and this is all very theoretical. They haven't actually built anything, but they're talking about how they envision using blockchain technology as a platform. Um, and so, promptly on the release of that news, the Bitcoin price went down by 20 percent. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> yes. Uh, quick thing about uh, Adept. They actually did a demo at CES, IBM and Samsung. Oh, cool. Uh, it was a demo at CES about a washing machine that used smart contracts. Right. The orders laundry detergent. Yes. The order right. laundry right. detergent for itself. <laughs> yes. So here's another interesting thing that most people haven't picked up on yet, which I think is really cool. Um, until Bitcoin, the only thing or entity that could own and control money was a human being, or the legal fiction of organized human beings, a corporation. With Bitcoin, a machine, a device, a software agent, a non-human entity can own, manage, and control Bitcoin. I don't know what that does. I've read about it on Reddit. <laughs> you know, they these really good stories where it goes, you know, and then the blockchain forked, and in 2027, in version 137, the blockchain became self-aware. <laughs> 14 hours later, drones. <laughs> you know, so it's like a, a riff on, on Skynet and, and the Terminator, but. I don't know what happens when machines can use wallets, and one theory is that they use that to exterminate humankind because they haven't kept up on the interest payments. Um, another theory is that you can do some really interesting things, including, among other things, um, autonomous organizations or distributed autonomous corporations. One of the idea, for example, is a charity that operates based on a mathematical organizational charter and disperses funds based on an algorithm and is not controlled by anyone other than the people who fund it. So um, interesting things there. Yes. Let's uh, let's take a couple more questions and then wrap it up. So, so you made a really interesting comment earlier about the subjective idea of truth. And truth has been maintained by the people who do hold the power. And I'm thinking of this truth as something that's relative to the nature of Bitcoin that we have about 70% of the market right now who's holding because they are all investors who are interested in Bitcoin to see the price rise. Now, what's interesting is that we create an interesting paradigm by distributing this to the unbanked in that the success of Bitcoin as an investment actually depends as well on the economic success of the people who are living in places like Africa. Because as they are participating in a system 
system as they are the users on the system, their value actively shapes the system in and of itself. Now, my question is about marketing. Because I personally feel that it's imperative for us to tell people, specifically millennials who are open to innovation in an amorphous stage of self, they feel like they're victims of the machine because they're all deeply in college debt. They don't necessarily align with an institution. Mm -hmm. They're primed to adopt, and so are globe trotters who will want to use this for a trial. I, I, I'm not sure we really need to market. So I, this is a discussion that's going on in the Bitcoin community all the time. and. I, I, I think that there is a risk in aggressively marketing Bitcoin to people who are not directly interested in this technology. And the risk is that, on the one hand, you come off a bit kind of evangelistic and preachy. Right? Uh, you know, I, I, can, I can be really optimistic and enthusiastic about this technology in this forum, because everybody who is here is selected to be here to hear about Bitcoin. And many people here share my vision of it, but that's not the pitch or the discussion I would have uh, in a completely different form. Um, I think making um, making marketing presentations about Bitcoin runs the risk of either getting people who are not ready to adopt it or not ready to get involved in it involved too early. They have a sour experience; they turn away, and you and you get a backlash. Or worse, you get people who are not ready to um, secure their Bitcoin. They get some Bitcoin, they then lose it because they trust someone else with their keys. We've seen that happen a lot of times. Um, and you know, I think it requires a lot of work. Here's the little secret: useful things don't need marketing. Bitcoin is the type of technology that solves massive problems for very many people. And these problems in many countries are problems of life and death. And so all you have to do is create the space for Bitcoin to happen, create the technology infrastructure, make it available, and then it markets itself. Like for example, I don't need to go out and talk about foreign remittances and um, try to market Bitcoin to Mexican immigrants who are trying to send money to Mexico City. Western Union does my job for me, right? By being expensive and slow and inconvenient and uh, screwing them over on the exchange rate. And if you talk to, like I did recently, my Iranian taxi driver or my Somali taxi driver, then you start hearing the real horror stories about Western Union. So all I need to do is find out how to make that technology accessible and available, and if it does work, demonstrate it to one person and say, "Hey, why don't you try it? See if you can send a bit of money, and maybe this is a slightly better way. And if it works, trust me, they'll do the marketing. You won't need to." Um, there are places in Central Valley here in California where fruit pickers are bussed every Friday to a giant department store owned by the fruit company where they get to get their paycheck in one line, send most of their paycheck back to Mexico in a second line, and get soap and basics and fruits and some food in the third line. And they run them through that line like cattle. There's hundreds and hundreds of fruit pickers with those three choices. Massive line to get their paycheck, massive line to send that through Western Union right next door. I want to have a guy park in the parking lot with an Android phone and empty that second line. Because the first time they're only going to try and send ten bucks, but if it gets there, everyone they know will know about it. So we don't need to market, we need to build. If we build, they will come. All right, I'll I'll leave that as the last uh, question. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'll be signing books and we'll do a raffle. Thank you. We're going to kick off the raffle and get the bucket. And Andreas is going to right, we'll just give uh, you know a couple of minutes in case anybody who hasn't participated in the raffle but wants to participate in the raffle, this is your final chance. Last couple of minutes. I have the bucket here, and I have a pen.